this morning, first of all, don't forget there's no service tonight. Deacons, don't forget deacons means tomorrow night. And JB, you don't look a day over 59. There you go. So, uh, amen. Amen. And I pray that this will be a great year for each and every one of you. And I want to share with you this morning a passage of scripture out of Isaiah, chapter 42, verse 9, talking about giving this new year. And I want us to get it a kickstart because sometimes, you know, we need that. Because uh, as we do get older, Sometimes we need a little boost, you know? And uh, so I pray that this will be a great year and we can begin it. But let me say this to you. As with any new beginning, that means we have to lay aside all those things that are behind us. Because if you go and carry those old things that you've already turned over to the Lord, those old heavy baggages of failures and mistakes and hurts and all those things. If you drag them into 2017, guess what? They're yours. They're yours. So don't do that. Isaiah 42 verse 9 says, Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now let that just sink in your spirit. The former things have come to pass and the new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Here we are once again at the beginning of a new year. As Brother Steve said, as he already got into my notes again, but it is a time for a reevaluation. In a season of new beginnings, or well, that's what we said. How many times in life have we started? a new year without realizing that we've not made any plans. We've not set anything before us. And so as we begin a new year, we have an opportunity to make some changes. Now, again, we can't live in yesterday's blessings, nor can we live in yesterday's disappointments or failures. This is a time that the apostle tells us that it's in us to move forward, to live in the future, and to live in the present. Paul puts it this way in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. He says, Brother, I do not count myself as to have apprehended. In other words, I've not gotten there yet. There's one thing I've learned in life, that life is a pursuit. And, and in that, don't beat yourselves up. Life is a pursuit. Pursuing God. Listen, the day that you got saved is not the closest that you can get to God. No, there's much more. It's a lifetime pursuit of pursuing after God. He says, so I'm not apprehended, but one thing I do, and here's the secret that Paul gives us that helps us to embrace the blessings that are before us. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There is that upward goal. Listen, we never reach down to God. Now, he may reach down to us, but we're always reaching forward. It's Paul implies here that race that you run. Remember, it's a stretching forward. If you watch runners come up to the ribbon and they lean their bodies forward, that last burst of energy that after many times they collapse after they cross the finish line. But there's that last push. In church, I believe that 2017 will bring us closer to the finish line so many people all over the world I mean, all people are making New Year's resolutions, but in reality, you and I know that most people won't get them. Let me let me give you. Uh, the University of Scranton gave us the top ten uh, New Year's res resolutions. Let me give those to you. Number ten 
at the bottom of the list, is spend more time with family. I don't know how that got to the bottom of the list, but it ought to be a priority. Uh, number nine, fall in love. Hopefully you fall in love with, if you're married, the person that you're married to. Amen? Amen. Number seven on the list is quit smoking. Hope you can do that right away. Number six, learn something exciting. Number five, stay fit and healthy. Listen, I, I, that's my goal every day. Huh? Every day, as you can tell, I don't achieve it very well. But it's a goal, it's an aspiration that I have. Now, like Steve has something to say about weight. Don't, don't this make you mad when people like Steve get up and say, oh yeah, I, I gained 10 pounds. A little skinny thing, you know. And people like your pastor that looking for a new jacket had to say, you know what? Them old 40s and 42s just don't fit anymore. Besides you wear anyway, Steve. What jacket? 40? 42? 36? 36. I don't even want to talk to him anymore. <laughs> Number four, enjoy life to the fullest. Yes, 48% of America work way too hard. That's statistics. Of course, the other 52% don't work at all. 48% of America, only one in four Americans, forgive me, only one in four Americans take a vacation. I thought that interesting. And half of those who take a vacation, all right, two people, think about work during their time off. How about that? Can you believe that? People, people that, people that are on vacation think about work. You know, it's like if you have two weeks off, maybe the first week you're actually on vacation. The second week, you begin thinking about all the things that you're going to do once you get back to work. Why don't you just take one week off? Surprise yourself. Number three on the list, save more. Here, here's some of these good. So current levels of savings are an improvement over uh, 2070. In uh, 2016, we had a rate of 16 percent of people actually saved. But it was a far cry from people in 1971 who saved, Americans averagely saved 38 percent. And that's something back in the 70s, 30 percent. Did you know that 61 percent of Americans don't save anything at all? Save more. That was third on the list. Number two, getting organized. Getting organized, I thought this was interesting, there's a whole list of stuff. But it says the average person spends 1.5 hours a day or six weeks during a year looking for things they can't find. Six weeks out of this year you're going to waste looking for something that you can't find. And then number one on the list, number one on the list is to lose weight. That's the number one uh, New Year's resolution. Since, though, 35.6% of adults in the U.S. are obese. But 68.5% of adults actually believe he or she is overweight. It's not surprising that then losing weight is the top of the list. I mean, after all, only 35% are actually in that bad situation, and 68% believe they are. That's why it's number one on the list. May I say that Ken and Barbie have not gained a pound since 1959. But that's Ken and Barbie, not us. So, bottom line is this, that of the 30, 328 million adults, only one in 22 make New Year's resolutions. I guess we've gotten wiser. But only two of the 22, that's 7.8 million, will keep it for one year. That's why gym memberships love you. Because they know that you'll get a gym membership this month. 
but only two out of 22 will actually go to the gym for a whole year. Boy, they make money, don't they? Think about this, if you will. Hanging on, like I said, hanging on to old things. Isaiah chapter 43, let me read verses 18 and 19. It says, do not remember the former things. Folks, this is, this is going to help us overcome some things. Do not remember former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Praise God. Do you get that? God said, if you let go of the old things, I'll give you new things. Does I don't know about you, but if somebody said, aren't you trading your old truck? I'll give you a brand new truck. Guess what? Listen, I, I wouldn't be able to get my keys out of my pockets fast enough. Amen? That's what God's saying. Or, or how about taking away that old crumbling down house that you've been planning on fixing up for decades? What if somebody said, listen, here's the keys of a brand new home. Brand new. Fully furnished with new stuff. Except for jeans, knickknacks. <laughs> Dean would have to carry them with him. But can you, you wouldn't be able to get the keys. I mean, listen, God is saying to us this morning that if you let go of the old things, I will give you new things. Praise God. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 4.16, even though our outer man is perishing. In other words, we're all getting old. All getting old. Every morning uh, you wake up, sometimes your body screams at you, you're old! You know when you as a kid, you didn't think nothing about getting up. Well, you didn't get up until about 12 noon anyway. But, but what is it, the older you get, the earlier you get up. Well, why is that? Why, why can't you, and you know what? You get tired. The older you get, you get tired and you want to go to bed. And you lay down in bed and you say, man, this is great. But your brain says, no, you're not going to sleep now. Because that's when replay hits, right? You start thinking about all the stuff, you know. All sitting on the couch or sitting in a chair. Man, you were dead tired. You were, huh? <coughs> you go and get in bed and all of a sudden you're laying there wide awake. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have been done new. <coughs> Number two, how newness and fresh revelation come. All right, I've given you a list. All right, there you go. Number one, newness, because that's what we're talking about, beginning new, letting go. Newness comes by letting go of the past. No matter how miserably we have failed in life or in our Christianity, listen to me, God's desire is for us to receive His forgiveness and move forward. That's why in Psalms 103, 12, listen to me, somebody out here this morning, maybe you've, maybe you've made some mistakes this year, maybe you, you failed God, maybe you've not lived the way you knew you ought to. Listen to this, this is God's word speaking to you. Hear me now, Psalms 103, 12. Write it down because you need to, you need to go back to this when the devil uh, tries to mess replay on your VCR and show you how horribly failure you are. Psalms 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he, speaking of God, removed our transgressions from us. I guarantee you that's like a dog chasing its tail. If you start out east, guess what? You will never hit west. Try it. If you set a dead course hitting east, my brothers, you'll never hit west. Why? Because you're always going east, right? You'll always be going, uh, unless the earth is flat. And I don't think it is, but... Uh, I've never been in outer space, but all the pictures I've seen, it's round. So if you start out hitting east from Brunswick, go across the Atlantic Ocean, hit the continent of Africa, go across that Philippines, Hawaii, California, uh, all the places. Listen, you'll always be hitting east, won't you? 
So just get in your mind, that's what the psalmist wanted us to get, is that as far as the east is the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God, that's what God has done for you. That's why by letting go of the past, God has a wonderful future for us. Now here's the danger. Jonah, for example, Jonah was sulking and disappointment came because he didn't obey God fully. He had no idea what God was doing. Now listen to me. You, you may think that you have failed. You may think you made a mistake. You may think you have erred, but let me tell you something. You don't know what God's done. You may have made a decision in 2016 on the surface look like a bad thing. Your heart was broken. Your mind was upset. You dwelled on that thing for days and weeks and months. But listen, you may not know what God was doing. Jonah thought that God was crazy trying to save those people of Nineveh. But you see, Jonah was looking through Jonah's eyes. He didn't see what God was wanting to do. All Jonah saw was all those horrible rock people. But what God wanted to do was to save and redeem those horrible people. One of God's principles concerning new things is forgetting the past and not walking in condemnation. But rather, where to walk in the freedom that God gives us in His forgiveness. Let me read to you Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore is therefore, I mean there is therefore, now no. You have your Bibles underlined. I hope you've done that. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now that's all important. Because you've got to let go of the past. <clears throat> and you can't live in the old man anymore. Do you hear me? Don't live in the old man. Many times, you'll be in the right place at the wrong time. Many times, that's because you focus on yourself. Sometimes, we have things mixed up. We're to be God's servants, and that's what the latter part of what Paul is trying to teach us in the passage of Scripture, that we're not to walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, is that sometimes we live in our old man. And I'm going to tell you something. You know, when God has made you new, you need to walk in the newness of the Spirit. If you go back and start trying to walk the way you used to, because it's familiar or because it's comfortable, I encourage you this morning to make that part of your new year change. That God, I'm not going to live in my old man. I'm not going to live as I did once before. And when that old man comes up again, you have to rebuke him. When your old ways tries to get you to go the old direction, then you've got to rebuke that spirit and pull back hard by the help of the Lord Jesus Christ and walk according to the Spirit because the old man will drag you down every time. Number two, newness comes by hungering, thirsty, for it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, here's the promise, for they shall be filled. What does that mean? Simply, you have to want it. You have to want it. Folks, if you want any change to ever happen in your life, you've got to want it. You've got to... You've got to like you're hungry for a glass of water. You've got to want it bad. You know, some people drag through their lives, never getting the glory and the victory over things. And, and, you know, they keep allowing the old man to drag them down because they don't want it enough. You, you see, to get in a closer, deeper walk with God, you've got a desire to where you're wanting to sacrifice, to where you're wanting to make some major changes, maybe, in your life. Number three, newness comes by allowing God to renew our spirits. What does that mean? That means get in touch with God. Begin to talk with God. David prayed for God to create in him a new heart and renew a right or steadfast spirit, spirit with him. This should be our heart's attitude. Let me read to you David's song that he wrote after he had committed sin, adultery, and murder. He says in Psalms 51 verse 10. Now let me say something to you. 
You say, Pastor, I mean, God can forgive a man that has committed adultery and then murder to cover up his adultery? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Now, what sin have you done that the devil has told you that God can forgive? God says he can forgive it. He means it. And God will do it. God will forgive that. David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast, steadfast spirit within me. I'm convinced one of the reasons why many people do not change as much as they would is because they are unwilling to walk in the new way and rather walk in the old way. That old way is wrapped up in all the sins and failures of the past. Our cry of our heart ought to be that God, that we should... Ask God to create in us a newness. A newness in our heart. A newness in our spirit. Yes, we do this. We'll put ourselves in a proper position for God to speak to us and to create in us a new thing in our life. It, it takes restoration. It takes renewal. It takes a renewed vision to move forward with God. Quit looking in the direction that what's brought you destruction. As if some way it's better. It, it, it's never amazed me, church, when people that have been saved and have, have tasted of the blessings and glory of God so quickly, when something happens that makes them mad, they're willing to go back into the old way of life. Now the Bible puts it kind of bluntly and kind of, you know, he said that's like a dog returning to its... Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. To want to go back to that old way of life, under bondage, under condemnation, under sin, I don't want to go there. Let me give you four ways to kickstart this new year. Number one, rely on the Holy Spirit. Rely on the Holy Spirit to help you and equip you. Colossians chapter 1 verse 29 says... To this end I also labor, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. That word mightily again is a Greek word, Gabriel, my little Greek student over here, which means a part of dunamis, mightily. It's a word for power. Don't you want power in your life? Don't you want strength in your life? Listen, God can give it to us. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, now you'll have to admit to raise a dead man takes a lot of mighty power. Amen? Amen. All right, all right. But if the, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, isn't that awesome? Get a hold of that because it makes the devil mad. When, when, you, when you grasp that, when you realize that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead after three days after being crucified, that same spirit dwells in you. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you three times. The word of God wants you to understand that the Spirit of God dwells in you mightily. You have the miraculous power, the resurrection power of Almighty God that dwells in you through His Spirit. Number two, build on past successes and learn from past failures. Charles Wendell states, failure, failures are only temporary tests to prepare us for permanent triumphs. Philippians says this. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. L listen, we all have failures in our past. It's what we do with them and how we respond to them that makes the difference. It's been said that a successful person fails two out of every five times. And that an unsuccessful, now this is the difference between a successful person and an unsuccessful. A successful person fails two out of five times. 
The unsuccessful person fails three out of, fail, out of five times. Well, as I said, it means the successful person tries just one more time. How many times have we just given up, thrown in the towel? Lord, I can't do this. I can't do it anymore. And yet we look at some Christian individuals that seems to be able to, to go that step up to be to ascend to that higher level that, that we don't think that we'll ever be able to get to. Why? I'll guarantee it because they tried just a little bit harder. I, I remember reading an article in Forbes. I had to read that magazine a lot. I just had to read one because it was assigned to me, okay? But I remember whoever this reporter was had interviewed five of the most successful individuals in America. And what they said was, and he asked all five of them, he said, what is the secret to your success? Do you have some special insight? Do you have some special genius? Do you have some special knowledge that you have? And all five of them said, nope. Nope. All I did was try a little bit harder than the person that gave. Folks, that's what the Word of God is simply saying to us. Try. Don't give up. After Eisenhower had won the Republic, Republic nomination for president from Robert Taft in 1952, a reporter asked Taft, Taft about his goals. He said, my great goal was to become president of the United States in 1953. The reporter smirked at him and said, well, Mr. Taft, you didn't make it, did you? But Taft quickly turned around and said, no, but I became senator of Ohio. You see, sometimes there are lofty goals that you might set. And just because you don't become president, but you become a senator, folks, doesn't mean that you're worthless and that you're to give up on life, that you're to give up on goals. No! You know, just because you were not able to read through your whole Bible in one year, and I would encourage you to do that. We can do that this year. I encourage you to read your Bible through. Every Christian ought to read through the whole <coughs> Bible. And you can do it one year. But may I say to you, if you don't happen to do that, if you kind of miss it by a couple of books, don't give up. Start where you ended up. Maybe you ended up in James or well, or you, even if you ended up in Revelations, think about, listen, start there and then do it again. It won't hurt you, I promise you. Set new goals. Learn from the past. Proverbs 29, verse 18 says, there, Where there is no vision or revelation, the people cast off all restraints. But happy is he who keeps the law. Listen to me. Without a vision, without new direction, you are bound to repeat the mistakes of your past over and over again. If you keep doing the same failed actions, guess what? You're going to get the same failed results. And aren't you tired of failing? I, I, I like to ask people that. Aren't you tired? Because <coughs> if you keep doing the same thing and you keep getting the same results, do something different. Try something different. Try it a different way. Because this is how we overcome. So what are your goals for this coming year? Well, I encourage you to think about what your goals are for the coming year. And Brother Steve, write them down. Got my notes. Write them down. Make a list of areas that you want victory and enduring this coming year. Write them down. Lord, I want you to bless me in this area. But be careful. Don't make your list all about you, all right? Don't make your list all about you. Make it about somehow you want. Lord, I want to bless somebody, five people this year. I want to bless five people this year, Lord. I want to make them dinner. I want to take them out to dinner. I want to cook them something. I want to go to their house and say, I'll rake your yard. Maybe it's a older shut in, you say, I'm going to find somebody in my church that has need, and I'm going to find five people, and I'm going to do that this year. Now, maybe you give them all five done in January, I don't care. Or maybe, Lord, I'm going, to, I'm going to do something, you know, I'm going to do something. I'm going to give them myself more. 
You know, I'm going to give more. I'm going to become more responsible. Maybe you're here and you've never given an offering. You know, I've always told you, start somewhere. Start with a dollar. Start with a dollar. There are some people that never put anything in the offering. Never. Never. What? What if your employer or the government said, you know what? I'm not ever going to give you anything ever again. I want you to still work, but I want to give you things. What if, what if the government, Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, and all that, would just write you a letter and say, guess what? I realize that you've worked for 35, 40 years. I know you paid into the Social Security uh, Department, but guess what? I'm not going to give you any money anymore. Or what if they say, guess what? Uh, we'll give you a dollar. You say, Brother Arlene, you are messing with me. You're making me mad. Talk about money. I'm just saying, listen, if you've never given an offering before, Give something. Give something. Give something. Start. Because the Bible talks about it so much, I just got to preach it to you. So, so learn. Kick it up. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Build on past successes. Learn from past failures. Start new goals. And then finally, aren't you glad for that word? <laughs> Expect the Holy Spirit to bring forth new Expect. Listen, if you don't expect anything, guess what you're going to get? If you don't expect anything, if you don't expect anything out of yourself, if you don't expect anything, you know, I, I, don't, I don't expect nothing. Guess what you're going to get every time. If you don't expect to grow, you're not going to grow. If you don't expect to get closer to God in 2017 than you did 20, uh, uh, 15, 14, 13, guess what? You'll get exactly what you don't expect. But I expect, I because I believe, because I believe that greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. I believe that God is able to do all things mightily, with power, miracle-working power. How many like to see the miracle-working power of God? Don't you like that? I want you to stand with me this morning. And uh, Glenda?